everybody. Uh, it's a real, it's an honor and, and I'm excited to be presenting this material. Um, you know, I, I just wanted to say a little bit uh, about myself before we jump in here and sort of my trajectory and, and getting to this point and working with kids on the autism spectrum. But I, um, I come from a family of, of medical doctors. My father's a cardiologist. My got a couple uncles, a pulmonologist and an internist. My, my aunt uh, went to medical school at 48. And my grandfather was a psychiatrist working with Carl Manager at the Manager Clinic in Topeka, Kansas in the 50s, one of the foremost psychoanalytic um, clinics at that time. And so I was scripted in some ways to go into medicine. And uh, after traveling in India for a year and studying in Tibetan monasteries in the mid 90s, came back and realized that I needed to do a type of medicine that was more holistic and uh, found myself in a homeopath's office. He helped me out a lot, and I was hooked on homeopathy. Um, enrolled at the National College of Naturopathic Medicine um, that fall, and was what in naturopathy, in naturopathic school, we call a homeo head. Um, and what that means is that I, I took all the required homeopathy courses, all the electives, preceptored as much as I could, uh, with homeopaths in Portland, and uh, and then in 2001 went to Mumbai, uh, where I organized uh, an eight-week uh, uh, residency in a homeopathic hospital there, and that was really formative for me um, in terms of sitting, you know, with homeopaths that uh, are working in the trenches and are not rock star homeopaths and traveling all over and teaching and coming up with with new hypotheses and theories but just seeing 30 to 40 to 50 patients a day and doing great work um, and that was really really inspiring i really saw the scope of what homeopathy is able to treat in terms of of the range of pathology and some fairly severe pathology and that was really um, quite an experience for me and inspiring. I came back um, and in the spring of 2000 and, uh, 2002, I was at the NCH conference in Phoenix and sat down for lunch with uh, doctors Bob and Judith Reichenberg Ullman and started talking about how I was graduating from school and how I was, I was really, like in India, everything is done kind of on a preceptor basis where whether it's yoga or Ayurvedic medicine or homeopathy, you find a master and you study with them and, and learn it that way. And so I was really uh, quite blessed and fortunate in that I sat with Bob and Judith for four years and sat in on their cases um, one day a week and went over my difficult cases um, during those four years. And, and we, we co-authored in 2004, a drug-free approach to Asperger's syndrome and autism, and of course, Asperger's syndrome is no longer used in the DSM-5 criteria, but that book's been translated into German um, and Japanese, and so that really sort of launched me into working with kids on the spectrum, and you know, with Bob and Judith, we had a pediatric practice, so we were working a lot with ADHD, with obsessive compulsive disorder, with kids, depression, um, oppositional defiant disorder. So seeing a lot of a lot of kids and a lot of cases. Uh, in 2006, I came down here to Ashland, Oregon, uh, joined a practice, Dr. Deborah Gordon, who taught with Roger Morrison and Nancy Herrick. Um, and the last 13 years, um, I've been down here. I've been loving it here in, in Southern Oregon. Um, and I you know, I want to say um, before we get going that, you know, it's, in, it's, it's somewhat ironic uh, talking, I mean, doing, doing uh, this sort of webinar because I can't see any of you. I can only see my PowerPoint presentation. So the social interaction and the social communicative and the nonverbals that normally I'd be receiving from an audience, uh, eye contact and smiles or frowns or whatever you're experiencing is lost on me at this point. So I'm sort of flying blind without the reciprocal 
two-way conversation and uh, communication that is really at the core of, of what is challenging for people on the autism spectrum. So um, that said, uh, I want to, you know, I, I want to say that I'm, I'm very much, um, when I was working with Bob and Judith up in Washington, we did, I, we, I was really involved in the sensation method and Sankaran's approach and went to Mumbai. And in many ways, I've kind of come full circle. Um, and I'm really, I really take a very straight ahead uh, classical approach. Um, I'm really focused, and it's the reason I'm putting up this slide on, on aphorism 71. It, if only homeopathy was this easy, right? But we really only need to know three things. Um, we need to know what the natural disease is, and that's what I'm gonna spend a majority of this morning talking about, because I really want you to understand the complexity and the chronic nature of what autism spectrum is. It's, a, it's not an easy condition to treat, and we really need to understand and have a clear idea of what the presentation is so that we're able to suss out what is strange, rare, and peculiar about this case. And, and it's complicated because when you've met one person on the spectrum, you've met one person on the spectrum. There's incredible diversity and individuality with how somebody on the spectrum presents. There's higher functioning autism, there's lower functioning autism. Um, you know, intellectual capacity has a lot to do with that, and whether a child is verbal or not has a lot to do with that. But it's a complex condition. Uh, so I just want to make that clear from the beginning. Um, it's important Ian, to really understand. Ian, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, that we can see uh, we can see people. Oh, we can. Okay. I um. Let me. Let's see. Everybody that has okay, I can. It's off to the side. Okay, I've got a button. There we go. Okay, <laughs> I see. There's a dog in attendance too. <laughs> right. Black Lab. Okay, um, all the animals and people are present. Um, so you know, understanding the natural disease, understanding our medicines and Materia Medica, and how to apply. Um, our medicines to the natural disease is um, really at the core of, uh, of what we're doing here. So a little bit of history, um, Leo, Leo Connor, an Austrian psychiatrist, first published a paper describing 11 children who are highly intelligent, but displayed a, 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 they wanted to be alone and an obsessive interest on persistent sameness. He, named the condition early infantile autism. Um, then in, in 44, a year later, Hans uh, Asperger described a milder form of autism, which he had a, a case studies of, a, of boys, of all boys, who were highly intelligent, but had trouble with social interactions and specific obsessive interests. Uh, in 1980, Infantile autism was added to the DSM-3, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, which we use here in the States uh, in the field of psychiatry for diagnostic criteria. But what was significant in 1980 is that it was separated from childhood schizophrenia. So there was a, early on some diagnostic confusion uh, where autistic children were somehow linked with schizophrenics, which is a totally different um, diagnosis and condition, obviously. Um, in, in 87, the DSM-3R, infantile autism was replaced by autistic disorder. And what was interesting about uh, what happened this year in 87 was that there was the UCLA psychologist uh, uh, Lovas who designed uh, applied behavioral analysis, which was a, a behavioral approach, which is still used uh, to work with kids on the spectrum. And, you know, it was interesting at that time there was, they were using some aversive stimuli actually to work with these kids and they don't do that any longer. Um, but as I'll be talking about, you know, there's a, there's a lot of different points to enter the treatment, like with any pathology really, um, of, of autism spectrum. And there's interventions that are more upstream, there's interventions that are more downstream. And of course, as homeopaths, we're really, you know, we're really going for 
affecting the vital force and going as far upstream as possible, um, intruding the root cause. And some of the ABA behavioral approaches are, are really impacting more downstream behaviors. Uh, so I'll be, I wanna talk at length about that because there's several sort of insertion points for intervention and uh, as homeopaths, we're really trying to head upstream as far as possible to affect the behavior downstream. A lot of the conventional treatments uh, with autism spectrum using atypical antipsychotics, which scarily is quite common uh, with children these days, um, the percentage of, of uh, those prescriptions has really risen over the last 15, 20 years. And uh, antidepressants, there's a lot of psychiatric medications that are being used with this population. But of course, that is fairly far downstream, uh, affecting behaviors rather than the, the core issues that, these, that people on the spectrum deal with. In 88, uh, Dustin Hoffman was in the movie Rain Man, and maybe some of you saw that movie, but he was portrayed as an autistic savant with a photographic memory and, a, and an ability to calculate huge numbers. Um, it raised public awareness, but not every uh, child on the spectrum nor adult on the spectrum has these kinds of abilities or skills. It's actually quite rare. Um, but that did raise some awareness. In 91, uh, the federal government made it possible for uh, parents to get IEPs for their children to get uh, public school uh, special, special education uh, categorization. In 94, Asperger's syndrome was added to the DSM-4, which expanded the autism spectrum to include milder cases uh, with, with people that were more higher functioning. Um, and then in 98, that study in Lancet came out uh, about the MMR vaccine causing autism. And, you know, it was, it was debunked. Um, you know, still, this is obviously, you know, vac vaccinations and, and homeopathy and autism. Uh, it's a little bit like discussing politics and religion these days. I mean, it's one of these subjects that, like, is with the larger gestalt uh, culturally is incredibly polarizing. And, and that worries me because I think that there is a middle ground here. Uh, with vaccines and with the potential damage. And I, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I, I, I do not think that the MMR is linked with autism. And there recently was a, a big data study put out by the Danish government. 637,000 uh, children were looked at uh, between birth and 12 years old. They had a, a, a group of 30,000 that were unvaccinated, and the rest of the 607,000 uh, were vaccinated, and there were absolutely no differences in autism between those that received the MMR and those that didn't. And I, that's not to say that there isn't potentially some damage with vaccines, and I think that, that there is a handful of children that are vaccine damaged. Um, I do not think that the MMR is linked with, with autism, however. Um, but I do think that the, the rubric um, vaccinosis uh, and ailments from or aggravation from is uh, a, a valid rubric and I use it uh, frequently. Um, but there can be an encephalitis from both the measles vaccine and the actual measles disease. There can be seizures and there can be an encephalitis, a brain inflammation that can happen. But there are a lot of other potential uh, triggers uh, for autism, and we'll get into some of those. But, you know, with, with I think there's a certain level of we really want there to be one thing that is the trigger and cause of this, this really difficult, challenging condition. Um, but I think the reality is that there may be multiple environmental exposures, um, just chemically, thinking about how many different chemicals we put into the environment since World War II and that we're in this toxic soup right now and pregnant moms are exposed to these chemicals and it may be one, it may be 40 that are there at the right place at the wrong time um, to influence fetal development. So 
we know there's a genetic component involved. We know that there's a trigger involved, um, but we've still got a long ways to go to really understand uh, what's the cause. In 2009, the CDC um, estimated that the rates had gone from one in 150 uh, diagnosed prevalence in 2007 to one in 110 in 2009. And now, actually, in 2018, the CDC has released, uh, it's one in 59, actually, with there being a ratio of four boys to every girl that's diagnosed. Um, in 2013, the DSM-5 folded all subcategories of the condition into autism spectrum disorder, and they, they uh, did away with the Asperger syndrome diagnosis as a separate diagnosis. So the criteria vis-a-vis uh, -vis the DSM-5, um, it's really focusing on social communication and social interaction across multiple contexts. So it's not just at home, it's not just at school, you know, it's at social events, it's at Boy or Girl Scout events, it's at church, it's at the synagogue, it's at school, it's at home. These issues with interacting socially um, and communicating, uh, it crosses different uh, multiple contexts. Um, and it's really uh, a deficit in, in reciprocity, the two-way street of, of, uh, of social interaction. Um, you know, it's sharing interests. It's, it's, being in, it's, it's sharing um, an object of interest or a conversation subject of interest. It's, uh, it's difficulty with engaging and initiating a communication, that kind of relationality, um, having back and forth uh, conversation, that reciprocal aspect, uh, reduced sharing of, of feelings, emotions, and affect. And those three things are, are separate, and I just want a, a side note on that, that feelings are the subjective experience that we have. Emotions are what we express socially in a social context. And the affect is really the intensity with which the emotion is expressed. So, you know, sometimes those three uh, uh, words are, are conflated, but they're, um, in psychological terms, they're rather different. Uh, so the reciprocity, uh, then there's deficits in nonverbal communication um, and communicative behavior. So the eye contact is a big thing and you know, adults uh, with high-functioning with high functioning autism, verbal adults on the spectrum say, and children uh, will say that making eye contact with somebody is like having, watching 50 or 100 televisions at the same time. There's so much information that comes in through eye contact uh, that if you're not processing that information or it's not making sense, it's completely overwhelming. And so, you know, that aspect of, um, of communication, which involves eye contact, we use, we convey a lot with our eyes, uh, but it's also uh, facial expressions, uh, frowns versus smiles versus inquisitive looks. Um, there's hand gestures involved in communication. You know, we say that 90% that of communication is really nonverbal. And so the inflection of my voice, you know, is going to indicate whether I'm asking a question or making a statement. Um, but there's a lot of a lot of communication is nonverbal and done with gestures and and not necessarily about the words. Um, you know, sometimes a, a mother standing there with hands on her hips with a stern look on her face that expression may be lost on a child on the spectrum. They might not understand that mom is not happy when she is, has a frown and a stern look on her face. Uh, so those skills need to be learned. And, you know, I, I will say that um, in general, the prognosis for somebody, especially with high functioning autism, is, is positive, is good in that there, there's ways of learning how to interact with others in social skills groups, and there's, there's places where kids can really learn how to have a, uh, a neurotypical uh, conversation with somebody, that those skills can be learned. They still can sometimes seem rote, 
um, like the child is is uh, mimicking data on Star Trek or something like that, where the intonation isn't so fluid. Um, but these things can be can be learned. Um, so there is hope for this. So, uh, and the third thing, deficits in developing, maintaining, and understanding relationships. Um, it's you know, without that, without that aspect of relationality, with shared interests, um, with shared sorrow, with shared grief, uh, with shared joy and happiness, like these are really the, the experiences that bond people. It's how we relate. We share an experience um, and talk about it. And, you know, we, we have something, neurotypical people have something that we take for granted, but it's called theory of mind, uh, which is really essentially, it's a psychological term for how we walk in another person's shoes. Um, how, how much do we understand the intention of what somebody is, is trying to express, or the emotion, um, or the feeling that they're trying to, to convey to us. And, how able are we to relate to that and to sync up with their world and to relate? And these are the, the challenges that somebody on the autism spectrum uh, faces. And it interferes, obviously, with making friends, with maintaining friends, um, with initiating that kind of, of interaction, because a lot of interactions are around sharing interests and our experience with others. And those uh, abilities are, are, are challenged uh, with somebody on the spectrum. So what's interesting is that that first criteria, uh, A, um, a lot of those things are, are really downstream. You know, we, we, you know, ultimately this is what we focus on because these, this is what, you know, from a neurotypical perspective is challenging for somebody on the spectrum, the social communication and social interaction. Um, but there's, there's aspects of autism that are much further upstream. And some of these um, are, are somewhere in the middle. Um, number four, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to emphasize this over and over and over again. Uh, but there is, and let me just back up a second. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen the movie uh, with Claire Danes in it called Temple Grandin. It's a biography of, of Temple Grandin's life. And uh, she's probably the most well-known, best, best known uh, adults with on the spectrum. And that movie, I just, uh, I rewatched it uh, a few nights ago, and it is, I really encourage you to watch it because one thing that they do an exceptional, I mean, the movie's fun to watch, it's a great film, but one of the things they really did an exceptional job with was giving the viewer a sense of the, 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 the sensory stimuli and processing issues that frequently people on the autism spectrum have to cope with and it's sound and it's visual and it's touch and it's all these aspects of sensation that most people who are neurotypical are able to take in sensation and remain regulated and to have an interaction um, because of, of they're regulated and they're taking in this information they're able to block out some of it they're able to take what's important in but they're regulated and this movie did such a great job of, of zoning in or, or focusing in on, say, a spinning fan on the ceiling or when she's in the cattle yards, uh, Temple Grand Den, you can, they pick up the sounds of the cow and the opening and closing of the gates and the, the, uh, the cattlemen that are, are prodding the cows and all of these extraneous sounds that somebody who's neurotypical is just going to sort of uh, uh, push aside so that they can focus on what they need to. But that's not the case with somebody frequently on the autism spectrum. And I, I cannot emphasize enough how upstream that sensory processing aspect is of autism spectrum. It really influences the emotion 
um, and feeling that somebody experiences and it vis-a-vis -vis influences our motor movements and our behavior uh, for somebody who's on the spectrum. So there's that sensation, there's the feeling that it evokes, and there's the behavior that that feeling is based upon. And, you know, I want to get into Stanley Greenspan's work uh, because he's really provided some, some brilliant insights into how the autistic brain kind of functions. Uh, but I really want to emphasize that this is something that homeopathy, and I, I want to do a whole part, a portion of, of this uh, series on this, but sensory processing disorder, hyperreactivity or hyporeactivity is really one of the most upstream aspects of working with people on the spectrum. It really influences everything downstream, uh, right down to behavior. So... In this category, uh, there's restricted, repetitive behavior, patterns of behavior, interests, or activities. So there can be stereotyped or repetitive motor movements, use of objects, or speech. And what that can look like uh, with speech, you know, sometimes there can be um, hyperlexia. There can be, they can, it, a five-year-old can sit down and start reading the Wall Street Journal. They're not going to understand really the meaning of it at all, but they've got a sense of, of, of language in that way, of words. There's frequently um, echolalia, where uh, a child would just simply repeat what they just heard, um, an echo, uh, a classmate or a parent or a teacher, but without really understanding the communicative, the meaning, or the context uh, of, of or the praxis of what is being communicated. Um, stereotype to repetitive motor movements. You know, of course, flapping is, is one of the most uh, well-known flicking fingers. Um, they're, you know, frequently visual uh, uh, gestures and stereotyped movements. So a child will be wiggling their finger out of the corner of their eye and sort of being stimulated by that movement. Um, you know, re re repetitive uh, spinning, like I just said, is, is also, you know, a common one, but repeated me uh, motor movements, use of objects. I had a, a young patient who um, was a paper shredder and would have this repeated motor movement of slowly, perfectly tearing a piece of paper and then going and tearing the next and, and would make these small one inch narrow pieces of paper, you know, five or six of them per uh, eight and a half by 12 or 11 inch piece of paper and would vocalize as they were doing that. And, you know, this is, um, it's, it's something that a, adults with autism will talk about as being very calming for them. It's a little bit like, I think about it actually like when people, uh, you know, do prayer beads, a rosary or a mala in Buddhism where they're reciting mantra and doing something repetitively, that it really focuses the mind and can be quite calming. And, you know, People on the spectrum talk about how that spinning, uh, which is also a vestibular thing, and it's stimulating um, and uh, can be calming like that, but some of those repeated motor movements shouldn't necessarily be uh, suppressed because they're, they're a calming technique and an ability for the child to self-regulate. But this is done with movement, with speech, with objects, uh, there can be a strong insistence on sameness and an inflexible adherence to routines and ritualized patterns of verbal or nonverbal behavior. So, you know, when, when uh, a family, uh, uh, some parents decide they're going to move the couch from one side of the room to the next or paint the walls or, or change up the art in the living room and the child on the spectrum comes home from school and absolutely flips out because the living room wasn't isn't what it was like when, when they left that morning for school, um, that can be the grounds for a serious meltdown because the really consistency and things needing to be in their place um, 
and to be consistent are really, uh, that again gives them a sense of, of, um, of safety and, 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 you know, and to a degree, I mean, all children are like this. Um, you know, I have a three and a half year old uh, daughter at home and she doesn't like it when, when her toys get moved. Um, and uh, so, you know, this is, this is something, it is a matter of degree, really what we're talking about, but but, you know, another example, it's not uncommon, I've heard this from, from numerous parents, that when a child is picked up at school and say they're driving home, mom's taking them home, and there is a detour because of traffic, and the child is so accustomed to taking that one route between school and home, they know the streets, they know where they're taking the left, and know where they're taking the right. So with, with you know, some traffic uh, rerouting, that can be really upsetting, and again, a cause for a meltdown if there's not uh, that that same same routine or pattern. That sameness is really held on to. Uh, fixed ideas is a rubric that I frequently use when we're talking about these insistence on sameness um, and routine. So highly restricted, fixed, fixated interests that are abnormal and in intensity. Um, you know, and this, this can look, you know, uh, an interest in, in bionicles, um, an interest in watching water dry on the sidewalk, and a child can spend a couple hours pouring a glass of water on a hot summer day on a hot sidewalk and watching it evaporate, or, you know, the, the hydraulic hinge on a door, opening a door and allowing it to close slowly, and that, that steady, slow movement to the door is shut and then opening that door again. So a lot of kind of a, re a restricted, fixated interest. Um, there's so many of these uh, and every child is different. But, you know, sometimes that, sometimes we talk, um, you know, a euphemism that's used for that restricted uh, interest, fixated interest aspect of ASD. We talk about them as grand passions. Um, which is sort of a euphemistic way of, of saying that, you know, a child really can get into a single uh, sphere of study. And this, of course, you know, with, um, like with autism spectrum in, in general, there can be a gift in having that kind of single-minded focus, and there can, be, there can be challenges to that as well. And, you know, I'll talk about in just a bit, uh, Bill Gates, you know, who is speculated to, to have high functioning autism. And if you've seen any videos of him, you know, it's very stilted, uh, the way that he communicates and a lot of his gestures, there's something, it's a little bit like data and Star Trek, um, where it's just a little bit, it's not um, so spontaneous and there's not this kind of natural reciprocal flow um, in watching him interact in, in old videos with, with other, on YouTube or whatnot, with other people, but it's quite stilted. But where would the world be without Microsoft? Um, you know, there's the technological revolution, Bill Gates had no small part in, in creating that. And, you know, I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of people probably down in Silicon Valley who are probably on the autism spectrum. Um, one thing I find really interesting about that is, is that a lot of these parents doing tech jobs in Silicon Valley are sending their children to Waldorf schools. <laughs> so I think there's some recognition here that, um, you know, that technology, um, you know, that there's other ways of, of uh, teaching children um, but I just, I find that interesting that that's happening. So, and again, the hyperreactivity, the sensory processing, I'm going to be coming back to that again and again. Um, okay. So these are the, the, uh, I just, I just noticed there's a chat here thing that I want to, and Montessori schools. <laughs> okay. Yep. Um, so let me go back here. Thank you for that addition. Yeah, and I, I'll check the, the chat box. 
Um, but um, um, here we go. I just want to go back to this. So levels of severity, it really has to do with how much uh, support a child is needing. Again, one in 59. Um, so there's definitely, I mean, you see this slope here. There's something going on uh, in terms of diagnosis and, and why have the rates and prevalence of, of autism really skyrocketed um, to one in 59. Uh, in not such a uh, short period, not such a long period of time. Now, uh, there is, it's a, autism is a multi-causal, we use a multi-causal model uh, with the predisposition and the susceptibility and the triggers. And this isn't, uh, most pathology falls somewhere on a spectrum between something that is strictly genetic uh, Down syndrome versus, you know, say something like cigarette smoking and lung cancer, which is obviously um, very environmental. And uh, the trigger being the carcinogenic aspect of cigarettes and cadmium and all the rest of it. Um, uh, but, but of course, there's, there are people that are smoking at 95 uh, without lung cancer and and doing that. So there's a genetic piece even there. If you're born with those genetics that allow your liver and glutathione and everything that's involved with detoxification is functioning optimally. If you're the 1% of 1%, then, you know, maybe you can get away with smoking until you're 90 without lung cancer. But that said, you know, we're really working on a, on a, uh, both the genetic susceptibility and a trigger. And we don't fully know uh, what the triggers are, but we do know that there is a genetic aspect um, predisposing people to um, autism spectrum. And we know this in looking at identical twin studies. Uh, up to 95%, if one child has ASD, the sibling, the identical sibling will as well. Um, of course, that raises the question, what about the other 5%? If both of the identical twins are in, in, in utero at the same time, exposed to the same emotions that the mom is having, exposed to the same environmental triggers uh, that the, the mom is exposed to and, and the chemical soup that we live in, uh, 2019, what about those 5%? So that, you know, that's a little bit... Um, you know, it's 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 one of those things that there's a mystery there, and I, I we don't have the answers to that yet. Um, parents who have one child with ASD also have a two to eighteen percent chance of having a second child uh, who also is on the spectrum. Uh, children born to older parents are at a higher risk for having autism spectrum, and both maternal and paternal age were independently associated with this. A small percentage of children who are born prematurely or with low birth weight or at greater risk. Um, birth trauma uh, also has uh, a role in this as well. So this, so acetaminophen uh, places children at risk for both ADHD and uh, the autism spectrum. And there's a 30, when, when a mom's been on Tylenol or acetaminophen for a month, um, the chances of having a child with ADHD are increased 34%. Uh, the chances of developing autism later on are 19% with this population. So this is a study that just came out recently. We know that there are triggers. Um, and if there's a genetic susceptibility and the, the trigger at the wrong time, wrong place, uh, autism spectrum is elicited. So... Also during pregnancy, valproic acid, which is a seizure migraine drug that's used, and thalidomide, which was used during the 60s uh, for, for nausea and vomiting during pregnancy. They, thalidomide was linked with um, birth defects, and so they took it off the market for use during pregnancy because it clearly was, was impacting the fetus. It's now used uh, for seizure disorder. Um, but not with pregnant women. So Pitocin and other analgesics during labor and delivery, um, there can be an increased risk for developing autism. And uh, cesarean section um, and birth trauma also uh, 
contributes to 12 to 13 percent of children on the spectrum, according to the CDC. Um, and opioids, um, you know, as if the, the um, opioid epidemic right now and the number of lives that it's taking isn't enough in and of itself. There's also recent uh, data just coming out uh, last summer that, that women uh, on opioids just before becoming pregnant were more likely to have a child than the autism spectrum, spectrum disorder. So or with other developmental disabilities. So we definitely know that there is, there are triggers uh, for autism spectrum that uh, we're being exposed to, and there's probably a lot more that we don't know about yet, um, unfortunately, but something to keep in mind. Um, so this aphorism number nine is really one of my favorites in the organon because you know i'm constantly I, this is this is what makes homeopathy so wonderful and this medicine so fulfilling and meaningful even if it's difficult frequently but this aphorism what is health what are we really going for here in treating these kids um you know, our, what, what does it mean? Uh, what, is a, what is the higher purposes? What are the higher purposes of existence? What does that mean for a child on the spectrum? And how can we, we free ourselves up? You know, one of the definitions of, of health is that it's freedom. And freedom to be able to respond spontaneously to whatever arises in one's environment, which has a lot to do with self-regulation. But how do we how do we deal with the stimuli without pushing it away, without totally getting submerged in it, like with depression or OCD, or or disassociating from an experience? How do we just be with the experience? Um, and how can we, what are the higher purposes of, of our existence vis-a-vis -vis aphorism number nine? You know, and, and so there's, and this is different for everybody, um, and really sort of dialing in what, with, with any patient, you know, I, I, this is something that's really near and dear to my heart because I, I'm, I've really become in the last uh, five years very interested in the field of palliative medicine and, and, how, and how similar um, homeopathy is in taking a holistic case with palliative medicine, thinking about, you know, how does a person suffer emotionally? How does a person suffer physically? How does a person suffer socially? How does a person suffer spiritually? And really taking a look at that big picture of how human beings suffer and where do we insert our treatment vis-a-vis uh, -vis what are the goals that the, the patient has for um, where they wanna be moving towards in terms of health, in terms of freedom, um, in terms of alleviating suffering. And so with palliative care, we're always thinking about any intervention, um, weighing out the potential risks of an intervention versus the potential benefits of an intervention vis-a-vis -vis what are the goals of care that a person has for their own state of health and well-being. And I'm always thinking about this uh, whenever I'm taking a case with an adult or a child on the spectrum. Um, with any case, actually, but what are we really going for? And what are, in the person's own mind, what are their higher purposes of existence? And I think 200 years ago, this was probably, you know, Hahnemann had somewhat of a, maybe a religious um, container, which with, he was thinking about this, and I think it's much broader today in 2019, obviously, but, um, you know, asking that question, uh, how do people suffer and what are they really wanting? And, you know, separating out parents' expectations from what the child is needing is no easy thing, but it's also that underlying undercurrent is happening when you're working with a child on the spectrum and you're trying to understand what, is the, what are the parents wanting for this child 
what is the child wanting if they can express it? Um, you know, vis-a-vis -vis what's realistic. Um, and, you know, this is one of the things that, that makes working with kids on the spectrum rather challenging. I mean, working with, with a child with ADHD, with OCD, with anxiety, with oppositional defiant disorder, any of it, depression, figuring out, you know, what is a realist, what is a realistic expectation for this child? How are the parents perceiving this? And how do you, I mean, it's a complex interaction and discussion, obviously, um, talking with parents about what is realistic for this child and what are they wanting and what are their expectations? Cure is a dirty word in the autism community. Um, no one uses, we're gonna cure your child anymore. Um, you know, and, and it switched to recovering your child from autism. And even that's fallen by the wayside to a degree. I think that there's a recognition now um, that our goal is not, not to cure, but to relieve suffering, like I was just speaking about with, with, with the realm of palliative medicine, um, and to maximize each person's potential. Uh, so we don't really use the word cure. And... I think that speaks to a number of things, but on, on one level, again, there's a lot of gifts that, that being on the spectrum confers. Um, so being on the spectrum means that a child is different. It doesn't mean that they're less than or defective in any way. It means that they're different. And I think that this is really a healthy way to think about you know, in conventional medicine, we often pathologize um, so that we can have a pharmaceutical that we can treat that pathology with to not really cure, but to subdue those symptoms that we pathologize. And I, I think it's really unscientific, but I, you know, in working on, on psychiatric units with people with really severe mental illness to, to put myself through naturopathic school, I really saw how a lot of the drugs that pharmaceutical companies were developing were shaping the diagnosis and the diagnostic criteria. And it just, it seems incredibly unscientific to me that the drug should be dictating what it is we're defining as pathology. It seems really backwards. But, but often that's what happens, um, at least in psychiatry, unfortunately. And I think thinking about um, how a person thinks differently about the world and, and both the gifts of that and the challenges of that, that we need to, to have a bigger view of what's going on for these children. Um, even for parents of children who are not on the spectrum, there is no such thing as a normal child. And uh, this is very true, and I think it's good to remind parents of this, that again, the child is different, not defective. Um, that they're not lesser than, that they just have it, they're wired differently and they have a different way of perceiving uh, the world than people who are neurotypical. So for a long time, the focus has been on, on sort of these downstream symptoms. You know, the body spinning, the flapping, lining up toys, repeating numbers, fixation of interests, lack of eye contact. Um, but all of these, again, I really want to emphasize that a lot of them, what's most upstream is the way that the child is perceiving their stimuli in their world. And, you know, we've got a lot of rubrics in our repertory for addressing how people perceive and process sensation. So it's a, real, um, it's a real boon, actually, that we have those rubrics and that there's a number of remedies that I found to be really helpful in addressing uh, sensory processing issues. I just want to keep on emphasizing that. I know I've said it four times already. Um, I'll probably say it again. So, but what really are the fundamental problems? What's the goal here? Uh, what does healing look like? Uh, Dr. Stanley Greenspan is a, a, a developmental psychiatrist whose who's work I've really uh, dived into and that I love, but his 
question, this inquiry, how does an infant uh, who's developing develop the miraculous ability to attend, to be calm and interested in the world, to desire to interact with others and to woo them around, to woo those around them to interact? The foundation of life is built upon the ability to attain and sustain a physically and emotionally regulated interaction. Um, how does a child learn to develop, uh, to relate with others with warmth and, and pleasure, to be intimate, um, to feel that closeness and to take joy in closeness, to communicate purposefully and meaningful, first with gestures, because even though an infant may not be speaking or communicating with words, Infants at a, at a very young age are communicating with gestures and, and some eye contact, and, and we'll talk about that in just a bit. Ultimately, how do we teach a child, or how does a child learn to be, to think logically and creatively, to have imaginative play, um, to be able to have theory of mind and, and step into another child's shoes so that there can be that connection and, and relating. How do they connect their motor, their emotions to their motor planning and behavior? And so we need to look at neurotypical development and really to understand uh, what is strange around peculiar. So and like I said, infants and toddlers are learning to communicate long before words come on uh, to the scene. At two to five months, they're responding to loud noises, or they should be with neurotypical development. Uh, they're noticing their hands. They're following objects with their eyes. They may be smiling, they're supporting their head, bringing objects to mouth, imitating sounds. Um, emotions begin to be transferred from an inner world to an outer, from the internal experience of a gas bubble to the preference for mom and, and her smell and her skin and her hair and her touch and her voice and all of, all of that gestalt of uh, sensory input. Um, the opposite, of course, is social withdrawal or social, social absorption. And again, I want you to be thinking about, you know, a child that has sensory processing issues and how that's going to impact their relating at a really young age, like just a few months old, with the world around them. Are they regulated enough to find partially hidden objects, to explore hands and mouth, um, reaching for objects? Are they rolling both ways? Are they recognizing emotion? Are they babbling at five to eight months? So this is something I really want to emphasize is the circle of communication. And by about six months, babies are able to transform emotions into behavior. And this is really, really at the core of autism spectrum. So I, I want you to step into recognizing and feeling and imagining, using your theory of mind, what this is like to have a circle of communication. Because this is true of infants, but it's also true of octogenarians having uh, circles of communication with each other. You know, imagine the scene of, of, a, of a, a three month old or a, or a four month old, five month old in a crib, and there they are. Here comes mom. There's the infant uh, looking up at mom. Um, here she comes, she's smiling. Her voice is soft and gentle. Um, her hair smells wonderful. Her, her skin feels soft, she's smiling. If an infant is, is regulated, they're gonna take in all that sensation, all of, of those various forms of stimuli and Presumably, in a neurotypical, regulated uh, young child, that's going to fill them with warmth and joy and love and a feeling of intimacy and feeling cared for and all of these positive emotions of, of, of a strong attachment and a strong bond. So there's the sensation of the mother coming in and being there with her infant, there's the feeling that it evokes within the child. And there's the motor movements that are evoked from that feeling, turning their head towards mama, smelling her, smiling, cooing, making eye contact and goo goo eyes with her. So all of that becomes stimuli for the mother. 
And she then experiences the feeling of warmth and connection and love and attachment and, and the oxytocin release and all of those beautiful things that, that parents feel when they're with their, their child, um, assumably. And then there's, there's a motor movement and there's a behavior and there's action that takes place where the mom moves in closer, maybe picks her baby up out of the crib and holds her close to her chest, maybe nurses uh, her. But there's just this, you know, you can see this circle of communication, right? How do we process sensation? What feeling does it evoke? And what motor movements are evoked from that feeling? And this circle of communication is a loop that we get into that starts very, very young and continues throughout our life. But, you know, just in thinking today during your interactions, how am I perceiving and processing the sensation with this person? Um, you know, what feeling does it evoke? And how are my gestures and body, my body movements and my eye contact? How is that related to the feeling that I'm having in this moment? That type of circle of communication is really um, compromised, often at the level of sensation with somebody on the spectrum. And so if we can intervene upstream at the level of sensation, then yay, we may be getting to a more positive affect and feeling around the interaction and then different motor movements and behaviors based on that feeling. So keeping that sort of model in mind. Um, early detection and awareness is important. There's, you know, hypotonia, um, is not uncommon where uh, a young child may be floppy like a rag doll, refusing to cuddle can be a sensory, a sensory stimuli processing type of, of issue. You know, and just to go back to Temple Grand Inn for a second, one of the things that she invented was the squeeze box. And she got this idea by watching cattle go to slaughter and that they were really calmed and stopped mooing when they were in this machine that applied pressure on all fours on, on all sides of them. And she actually designed as an engineer, uh, a human squeeze box that she could use in graduate school after a really stressful day of a lot of stimuli. She would come home, get into the squeeze box, pull a lever and calm down because she was able to sensory regulate herself. Um, being cuddled, or hugged by another human being is quite different from a squeeze box uh, because human beings are so unpredictable. The, the cuddling, the hug may be uneven. There may be more sensation on the chest and less on the arms and that's uncomfortable if it's not uniform. So again, sensation, sensation, sensation is a lot of uh, what this comes down to and, and how it's processed. Um, not laughing or making squealing no noises by six months, not reaching for objects, not following objects, uh, peekaboo. Again, that early relationality uh, with, with, young, with young kids, um, shared interest. Now, I find this absolutely fascinating, but Geraldine uh, Dawson did a study in 2000 where she showed psychologists videotapes of one-year-old birthday parties and and then that that were a few years old and they looked at which of these children of the birthday parties that they showed at one year birthday parties um, ultimately were diagnosed with with autism and the psychologist and just watching these one-year-old birthday parties alone you know it's a uniform stimuli right there's a cake coming in with one candle that's lit there's a cohort of peers, young kids, you know, moving and, and, and messing around and making noise and distracted and all of the stimuli that's involved at a one-year-old birthday party. And this, this cake coming in and the birthday song and that whole gestalt of a lot of stimuli. Now, 78% of the time, these psychologists were able to predict whether this child went on to be diagnosed with autism spectrum. So even at one year of age, we're able to identify, you know, by watching a child at their one year birthday party, are they making eye contact with other children? Are they maintaining a social gaze? Are they responding when their name is called? 
are they tuned in to the event, the thing that's happening, which is the cake coming into the room, um, blowing out the candle. Um, so I just, I think that that's really interesting that even at one year old, we're able to, to witness, uh, you know, potentially some of what's heading towards autism spectrum. So these are more of the, we're creating a foundation for learning and cognition, language and symbols, joint attention, communication, pragmatics of speech, theory of mind, emotional reciprocity, social problem solving, attention focus, and executive functioning um, are all what we're orienting towards. Now, um, Oasis was an online group uh, in uh, let's see, 2005, 2006. And they did a, a, some research um, and, and interviewed a lot of adults with what was then uh, Asperger syndrome. And they talked about unanimously their wish, their suggestion to parents of children on the spectrum that their children are, um, that they're told about their diagnosis. And from a parent's perspective, because of that, you know, different, not lesser than, but to know why you know, to know why they're a little bit different than their peers uh, seems to be important for adults who are on the spectrum, but also to help parents figure out what interventions might be useful, develop IEPs, and to navigate insurance. Um, there's, a double, there's a double edge with diagnosis. Um, is there a danger in identifying too much with the disability, or any pathology for that matter? Um, you know, diagnosis is a, is a double-edged thing, especially with a psychiatric DSM-5 diagnosis. Um, and reminding a child continually that they're much more than a diagnosis, that they're a human being first and foremost. You know, as William Osler says, um, ask not what diagnosis a person has, ask what person a diagnosis has. And I think that's true of homeopathy, it's true of naturopathy, but we're really trying to understand the person first and foremost and how they suffer versus fixating in on the diagnosis itself. Um, what your brain is wired differently, not defectively, you have a different cognitive style versus a defective cognitive style. And I just love that Temple says this, but what would happen if the autism gene were eliminated from the gene pool? You'd have a bunch of people standing around in a cave, chatting, socializing, and not getting anything done. So, you know, the downside to, to, to being overly relational and to not having some um, fixated interest that, that uh, can benefit society. I try to keep the bigger picture of all the, the gifts and all the, uh, the additions um, and inventions and discoveries and all these things that people on the spectrum have added to our society. I, I, I think our society would be, would be missing a lot if it wasn't for people on the spectrum. So, you know, Carl Jung talked about nothing has a stronger influence psychologically on their environment and especially on their children than the unlived life of the parent. Um, I think about this all the time as a parent, um, and I face it all the time with working with parents with a child on the spectrum. Uh, you know, it's hard as a parent. We want what's best for our children, obviously, and it's a real, it can be a fine line between, you know, are we conscious enough about the unlived aspects of our lives so that we're not projecting them onto our children, but being careful with expectations that are realistic and really understanding who this child is in front of us um, and not imposing anything on them, I think can lead to health and freedom because the child just becomes who they are if they're encouraged to uh, and nurtured in that direction. And so a little dark, humor about this, and this is our spare son in case the first one doesn't live up to expectations. So again, when you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism, and this is sort of a comic about that, that not every person on the autism spectrum is gonna present exactly the same way. Some are gonna have 
um, you know, strengths uh, that others may not. Others are going to have weaknesses that others may not. Um, sometimes sensory processing, though rarely, may not be a big issue for somebody, um, but executive functioning might be. Um, so sometimes language, uh, you know, and just the, the stilted kind of rote data-like way of talking like a robot may be the challenge. Sometimes motor movements uh, might be the issue. So it's really different. And sussing out what, uh, what's that issue here is one way in which homeopathy is really the perfect fit uh, because we're able to individualize treatment. Uh, we're able to, a lot of these children really do have um, not only sensory processing disorder, but they're sensitive to medications. They react strongly to foods and have food sensitivities. And, you know, that's, that's a whole nother aspect of autism spectrum that when I'm wearing my naturopathic cap, um, I think obviously a lot about how is digestive function going? Is this child constipated? Again, sensation, but also are they getting their nutritional needs met? Is their liver functioning adequately so that the glutathione is there and they're able to detoxify? Um, do they have the MH MTHFR genetics so that they're not methylating properly? You know, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of sensitivity here in general with this population. Uh, and so we need to think about a child on the spectrum uh, holistically, that it's not just behavior, but it's the immune system, it's the, it's the gut, um, it's, it's all of these things together, uh, but it really demands a, a holistic approach. So, you know, what I'm gonna do here, um, so, you know, I've taken a long time. I really wanted you to have a clear sense of what we're working with here and that I think there's a lot of misperceptions and there can be a looseness or a laxity in not being specific or accurate enough in really who is autistic and who is not on the spectrum and who is somewhere in between but I really want you to be clear on what the natural disease state looks like. Um, like in aphorism 71, again, just to go back to that, we really need to be clear on what we're treating and we need to be clear on what is strange or peculiar vis-a-vis -vis what we're working with. Um, and of course, with any psychiatric diagnosis, you know, it's a little bit, because it is in the, in the social, mental, emotional realm, there is a lot of gray area there. Um, you know, it's a little different from having pneumonia or eczema, which is the, the, the diagnostic criteria are a little bit more contained. You know, there's, I, I hope I'm making sense. I don't, I'm not, I don't think I'm saying this very clearly, but um, I think within the realm of psych, psychiatry, depression, anxiety, those are very different experiences uh, for, for different people. And so what is strange, rare, and peculiar, um, you know, it, it's not uncommon uh, with that, within the criteria for ASD for there to be this circumscribed interest, for there to be routine, uh, you know, fixation and restricted interests, which, you know, mind ideas fixed really um, gets to, but what is fixed um, and what is the fixation? And that's going to vary uh, from child to child. So, you know, our, our Senecosum, you know, I, I actually learned this, uh, this way of presenting rubrics uh, from Sankaran when I was in Mumbai. And one of the classes that he taught in this hospital that all the Indian students were taking was that he went through Kent's repertory uh, the delusion section, actually, rubric by rubric by rubric, and talked about why each of those remedies were in that rubric, because each remedy is going to be in a specific rubric for different reasons. Um, and likewise, you know, in general, children on the spectrum are going to have fixed ideas or persistent ideas of rigidity, but there's going to be a different flavor, um, like with any rubric, for each of the remedies in that particular rubric. So, you know, our senecosum can be fixated on, on germs and anxiety around health and fastidiousness and anxiety. You know, both cannabis indica and cannabis sativa 
um, have have a lot of delusions and a lot of sort of fixed ideas about things. Um, uh, Hyosyamus, you know, how does that play out uh, in terms of the way that they're perceiving their world in a fixed way? Um, you know, some of the the uh, revealing themselves, um, some of this the sexual impropriety of Hyosyamus that you see. Um, the, the kind of antics that, you know, a child who's meeting Hyosyamus uh, might, might evoke. Um, fixed ideas uh, emotionally about grief. Mercurius with Ignatia. You know, Mercurius, suspicion and some violence and some, you know, so each of these remedies is really going to have a different quality to the fixation. Uh, so thinking about that, um, while you're looking at these rubrics. Um, so metarinum, you know, is a remedy that, that, uh, that comes up. Um, and, you know, the psychotic, the psychotic miasm, you know, we think about, you know, that cover up and some of these fixed ideas of like Thuya and metarinum, for example, and the psychotic miasm. Uh, you know, I think that those, why are those, uh, is that perception so fixed in those remedies? And so I think asking some of those deeper questions uh, is helpful. Mind, thoughts, general, persistent. Monomania is a great remedy to use. And a number of these remedies uh, will come up in the, the repertorization of a child with, with autism spectrum. You know, I want to highlight again, um, silica is a big one. Orum can be a big one. Carcinosin, of course, you know, Amy Lansky, um, and that cancer miasm, you know, that, that the lining things up is a common repetitive behavior gesture in, with children in the spectrum. So with Amy Lansky's book, um, The Impossible Cure, you know, carcinosin is not an uncommon remedy to come up when working with this population. Um, cuprum is another one, you know, very defended. Um, ferrum is one. It's not listed here, but, you know, ferrum has a huge sensory component to it. Um, sound can be really triggering for ferrum. And because they're so defended and can lash out in, in anger um, if they feel that their, their, uh, their defense is compromised in any way, um, can be, you know, both ferrum and cuprum can come up with, with working with kids. Tarantula, um, you know, the, the, you know, the gestures and the movement and the restlessness and all of that sensory craving aspect that we see in tarantula, um, that sort of fixation on, um, you know, drumming or dance or movement or the hyperactivity, what's really driving that? And, what is the mono, uh, monomania that gets expressed because of that craving for sensory input? Um, compulsivity falls within this, this larger you know, understanding of preoccupied and persistent and repetitive and rigidity. Um, compulsivity, again, arsenicosum, um, calcarea, carcinosum is in there. Cuprum again shows up. Uh, cuprum uh, acetacum shows up, iodum shows up in a lot of these rubrics, natrum ur does too, mercurius, um, ritualistic compulsive uh, behaviors, again, arsenicum, cuprum, iodum. Um, there's a lot of, as you can see, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of repeated remedies in these rubrics. And so here's what I do sometimes is just like I'll do a repertorization using just focusing in on some of these persistent, uh, fixed idea, compulsive, monomaniac, maniacal remedies. And, um, and I'm happy also to send this PowerPoint to you if you're interested. Um, you know, just let me know afterwards if you're wanting to look at this. But look how strongly cuprum comes up and arsenicosum and natromir and iodum and carcinosum is right up there. Um, Thuya is in there, Silica is in there, Helleborus is in there, Cali Carbonicum, you know, can be a very, a fairly black and white 
uh, thinker about things. They take it out on their families. They argue with their bread and butter, as, as Pathokos and, and Morrison would say, but they, um, there's black and white thinking. There's a rigidity there into the way that they're perceiving their, their world. Uh, calc silicatum, orum. Okay, I need to catch my breath. I, I, um, I hope this has been moving along uh, quickly enough for you. I, I tend to be somewhat of a slow and deliberate talker, so I've tried to speed up a little bit for this presentation, and I hope, I, I hope my voice is at a normal uh, pace for all of you and not too slow and not too fast. So what I want to do, I, you know, we're, we're, it's a 10, 20 year time or Colorado time. I want to share a case with you. Um, I'm just going to share the initial consultation. And when we reconvene in a month, um, I'll go through the follow up on this case. But I want you to think about uh, what remedy did this little girl on the spectrum need? Um, and there's a, there's a, um, an emphasis on what we were just talking about with the preoccupied, persistent, and, and rigid aspects of that diagnostic criteria. So this is a, a seven-year-old girl with, on the spectrum with chronic sinusitis. Um, she's tall uh, and, and quite thin. She's tall for her age and quite thin, and her complexion is rather pale. She's clearly nervous about being in my office and looking around nervously, and it later comes out that she has, she's terrified of, of shots and needles and sharp objects, and so understandably she is apprehensive about visits to doctor's offices because she's got some negative experiences associated with being in them. I always talk about the pregnancy uh, with the mom uh, with every pediatric case I take, there's, there's often, not all the time, but there's some clues. Um, there's sometimes the missing piece that, that you're needing to, to successfully come up with the similimum for a child in, in the, the course of the mother's pregnancy. But the mother got pregnant shortly after a miscarriage, um, so there was still some grief about that miscarriage, and she was also having excruciating uh, migraines. You know, and this is several years ago, and I don't think that we had the knowledge about acetaminophen and Tylenol at that point, but it's not an uncommon medication for pregnant moms to be on when they're dealing with migraines. And so I don't know, you know, now that we know this about Tylenol, that it increases the potential for triggering ASD by 19%. Whether that played a role in this, I wasn't aware of that at the time, but it's possible. Um, and not only that, but this poor mom also was dealing with the death of a parent while she was pregnant. So there was grief on two fronts happening um, during the pregnancy. So this little girl during her infancy, her mom described as melancholic, somewhat moody and very observant. She'd sit and watch everybody. She was very serious. Um, then she would become overstimulated and want a cave to hide in. Her first words were too much, uh, referring to sensory stimuli. She would get overwhelmed, especially after um, being around other children. When visitors came to their house, it was really too much for her. And she was affected by her 12-month uh, vaccinations, including MMR, actually. Um, but she became colicky. It affected her gut. Excuse me. She also stopped uh, smiling and was, was talking less at this point. Um, so the sensory processing was really evident quite early on. And uh, it was difficult for her. She didn't like touching things in general. She was worse with loud noises, worse with too much activity. She was really ameliorated by heavy blankets. Again, Temple Grand Inn's squeeze box. This is a helpful thing for children on the spectrum to have a weighted blanket to help them settle down and to feel that pressure and to feel contained and safe like swaddling does with infants. But she would be ameliorated by heavy blankets and weight and pressure. She hates messes and likes everything to be in the right place. So rather fastidious. She can't stand when her room is messy. If there's one or more sets of toys out, 
she'll just leave the room. She can't handle the, the disarray. Her tendency is to withdraw and cry if there's disorder, too many people, or too much noise. She's much better being consoled and carried by her mom. She dislikes foods being mixed or touching each other. Tacos and spaghetti um, are out because of this. They're way too messy. She dislikes bitter, sour, spicy, too strong of taste. Again, you know, that, that hypersensitivity, again, a stimuli. Um, are they hyposensitive or hypersensitive? I always find it interesting that tarantula, you know, in being somewhat hyposensitive craving sensation goes for the spices and for all the activity and the interaction and the drumming and the dance and the movement. Um, but there's other remedies that uh, are made worse by spicy and some of these strong tastes. Um, she's worse with milk and high fructose corn syrup. When they switched to goat milk, uh, she did a lot better. She put on five pounds in about a month and a half. Um, so that was really helpful for her to get off cow dairy, which, you know, for some kids just is a, is a really, really bad fit. Um, sometimes she doesn't eat something if she's not totally clear on what it is, and she's rather rigid around food. She tells people she gets crazy if she eats candy, which high fructose corn syrup for some kids, if they can't tolerate it or are sensitive to it, really can set them off. Um, anger, ADHD, you know, there's a whole slew of behaviors that, that corn syrup induces. Um, she's very disciplined about what she chooses. She's very restricted. It's hard for her to leave the house because she doesn't know what to expect. And she's leaving behind the routine and safety of being home. She's socially avoidant because kids are so unpredictable. She is sometimes able to play with one other child and can be calm and regulated with them if they're calm and regulated. Um, she likes to play with blocks and other things that can be easily structured, right angles, square, uh, a, a strong uh, a regulated container. But she really needs to play with them and for the other child to play with them exactly like she wants the other child to play with them, which can be really disruptive to play dates if you're that rigid and that preoccupied with things being a certain way. Extreme indecision. Uh, we'll ask her to get dressed and she'll start crying because she can't find the exact pants that she wants to wear. She has a really hard time when we go to the store and we offer her two choices. It's really unmanageable for her. It's debilitating because she can't make a decision. She'll start crying in the store. She wants things structured black and white without gray. She would prefer that we make the choice for her. She has fears of thunderstorms animals. She's very scared of cockroaches and new situations. With new situations, she'll hang back nervously and just watch. She definitely doesn't just jump in. And she's really the least impulsive and spontaneous child I know. She never gets into trouble because she always follows the rules. She's never mean. She's never taught naughty. Um, many parents say she is the best kid they have ever met. But mom said, I think that's just because she's seen and not heard and she doesn't ruffle any feathers and she doesn't stand out and she's just this, this calm child that's trying to disappear a little bit and not be seen on some level. She has a history of eczema bilaterally behind both knees and on her feet. Um, her feet also peel and crack. Um, she couldn't have her feet enclosed by her shoes often because they would get sweaty and she crack and sometimes bleed. Although she really runs on the cold side. Um, and she would often say that our thermometer or thermostat was broken if it registered below 88 degrees. <laughs> and that would crank up the thermostat to mid to low 90s, um, uh, which disrupted the rest of the family. Big sleeper. Uh, she was napping up to three times a day. Um, she definitely doesn't have much energy uh, and like a normal seven-year-old girl would. She'll just lay down and go to sleep and she's sleeping uh, 12 hours a night, which is a lot for a seven-year-old, especially with three naps a day. So really pretty depleted of energy and uh, struggling on that front. A long history of sinusitis and congestion, um, 
that started at eight months of age, actually. It's thick congestion, it interrupts her sleep. It's thick yellow, sometimes it's bloody. Occasionally her sinus congestion goes into her lungs, but mainly she just has tummy aches and headaches. It's a right-sided headache, worse with light, better lying down. Her tonsils were chronically enlarged, um, two to three plus with, uh, with crypts, which you know is a sign of their indentations in the tonsils. These weren't kissing tonsils that were touching, but they were enlarged, and she was clearly responding. Um, it also turned out that there was mold in the house, so there were mycotoxins that she was probably chronically reacting to, and when they moved, um, you know, her sinus uh, symptoms improved with the remedy, but they really improved uh, considerably uh, after they moved into a house without mold. So she, the patient, said, sometimes I get nervous coming uh, to come out of my room because there's just so much going on out there and everything seems messy, confusing, and scary. My feet get sweaty and itchy. I hate going to doctors because sometimes they give me shots. I want to know if, if they're going to give me a shot uh, before I go. Phew. <laughs> I'm not used to talking for an hour and a half. I, I prefer to listen to people than to talk with people, honestly. And, you know, it's just helpful for being a homeopath because it's about the listening. But, okay. Um, I am going to unmute. Let me see. Here we go. So, you know, we are at the hour and a half time. Um, I do want, you know, a few minutes. I'm okay. I, I, I tend to like to finish on time just because I want to respect your time. But I do have a few minutes here. Um, if there are any questions, we could also, you know, carry it over to the next uh, session. And I, I want to say, a, I want to say, too, that, you know, I realize in preparing this material that... I've got more than three sessions worth. And even just today, I really wanted you to be um, aware of what the criteria were so that you know what you're working with when you see an autistic child in your office. And, and uh, so that took a lot of time. Um, let's talk about the remedy, uh, maybe at the beginning of our next class. Um, but spend some time with those rubrics and kind of look at the remedies in each of those rubrics vis-a-vis -vis what this case represented. Um, this isn't, um, you know, this isn't a complex case. And again, I really, I'm really trying to, in, in my 17 years in practice, I've really come around to the point of, you know, making things simple as possible. I'm really trying to understand the patient. I'm really trying to understand Materia Medica, and I'm really understanding, trying to understand how to apply my remedies and um, find the simulum and the totality of symptoms. So this is a pretty straight ahead case, and all of the cases that I want to show you are going to be straight ahead. Um, there's, no, there's no hypothesis here. There's no theory. Um, there's, I'm not using the sensation method with this class. I'm not using Mossimo's work. I'm not using the periodic table of the elements. Just using the patient's natural disease and the remedies in that. So. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> and Ian, if, uh, if you want to send me the PowerPoint, then I can distribute it to the people that like it. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. We can yeah. do that. Yeah, or however you like to handle it. I'll just send it to you, Barbara. That's easy. Okay. Yeah. Well, there any, are there any quick questions that, that you want to ask today? That, and if there's anything that comes up, we can talk about it next session, next month. But any quick questions there? When I'm looking at the, the chat here. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, thank you, Tracy. Okay. Um, did did this? Uh, okay. There is another. Um, okay. okay. Is there? Um, 
I don't know. I, I'm, I'm also open to feedback too. You know, I, I, um, I, I do some teaching. I'm, I don't do a lot of teaching. So is, is this format workable for everybody, the way that I've done this, sort of talking about rubrics and remedies and, and cases? Um, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, good. And if there's and, and I'm open to feedback too. So if there's anything that's not working, um, I'm a fairly relevant, <laughs> regulated <laughs> human being, so I can I can handle some some both positive and feedback, negative feedback too. So <laughs> don't hold back. I can handle it. I can take it. Um, let's see. There was. Pushback from parents and other doctors. Um, sure, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of pushback from doctors these days. Um, you know, not so much in. I mean, the town where I live in Ashland, Oregon, is really, you know, it's maybe a little bit like Boulder, perhaps, but it it feels like the west, most westest of the west coast in some ways. So there's a lot of a lot of openness. There's a lot of, you know, there, my, the, my associate, Dr. Gordon did homeopathy for 20 years. And, and so there's medical doctors, Doug Faulkner. There is, there are both medical doctors uh, here that are, are providing homeopathic care as well. Um, so it's nice to have that kind of support. Yeah. Yeah, autism spectrum disorder is uh, four to one is the current ratio uh, prevalence wise of boys to girls. You know, and there, there is a joke um, <laughs> that, that autism, you know, and it's, it's a little bit off, you know, it's a little bit, um, I don't know, it's a little bit something, but you know, sometimes uh, people like to joke that autism is just extreme maleness. <laughs> right? that there is i mean there are some gender differences here um you know fixated interests um you know not a lot of emotional reciprocity perhaps um not able sometimes you know not understanding theory of mind you know um not getting the emotional uh aspect just of, of what my wife is trying to convey to me and kind of missing the point or getting single-mindedly focused on one aspect without seeing the big picture, lacking empathy. I've been accused of all those things. I sort of history. All right. Well, Ian, I appreciate your doing this lecture today. Yeah. We're looking forward to the next one. Excellent. Yeah. Yep. And we'll, we'll, so third Saturday in um, April, I mm -hmm. guess, is up next. Yes. Everybody okay? No more questions? All right. All right. Well, take yeah. care, everybody. And I'll, I'll send you, um, <laughs> that's right. Somebody wrote that analogy will simplify diagnosis. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, I look forward to talking with everybody next month.